may have been a little bit of an infection going on with the uh with the with the ball sack eyeball situation for real for real hello everybody and welcome to this episode of the i hate matt wall poetry podcast where today we are continuing our conversation with matthew buckley smith Although, what I'm going to say, I'm going to say, with the words coming out of my mouth. This episode is brought to you by the good people at the Burroughs Foundation. I don't even know if that's a real thing. But this episode was put together in kind of the way Naked Lunch was put together. There was a podcast recording that lasted a long time. And we talked about so much stuff, and we went on so many tangents that, and if you heard the first episode in this series, which was the last episode, where we talked about Matthew Buckley Smith's book called Midlife, that episode was all the parts during this whole podcast where we talked about his book. The problem being is we would be talking about something and then go directly into something about his book and then come directly out of it and start talking about something completely different and then go directly back into um, talking about his book. So when we take all of the parts of talking about his book out, um, I realized that none of the stuff that we're talking about here Um, has a lot of context. I think you understand as we go. So there's that. The second part of this is um, on my members feed um, over like for people like in the Anarchy Crew and stuff, they're going to get a special episode where the other part that was being like talked about and pulled out and pulled in and pulled out, Buck's giving me therapy on how to go to therapy. Now, with that said... This episode here is almost like, um, I don't know, like if you got a big giant bag of fortune cookies and before you opened the bag, you just smashed all the cookies and then pulled all the fortunes out and then tried to tape them together to tell a story. That's what this episode of the podcast is. Okay. So there are many titles we could use for this podcast. We could call it, um, the cut up method, uh, the fortune cookie storybook. We could call it um, hating poetry. We could call it um, the intimacy of the editor. Uh, we could call it <laughs> um, daddy fucked me. We could call it um, th- there. There goes the monetization right there. Um, I, it, it just goes on and on and on. There are so many great titles for this episode and i'm gonna have to pick one and i don't know how i'm gonna do it um but yeah so there's all sorts of stuff that we talk about um in this section also um executioner jokes there's another fucking great title um surprise there's another great title uh let me see let me see let me see let me see he blew his head off that's another great title we could have used here um Smoking all the cigarettes. That's another great title we could use here. Um, so, <laughs> this is such. Oh, yeah. And um, sewing eyeballs into your ball sack. Yeah. I, c- I couldn't forget that one. Jesus Christ. So, that is your teaser for what you are in for right now. But, yeah, it was a great conversation. And talking with Bucks is always. One of the um, highlights of my month, whenever that happens. So, other things, real quick. Bombay Beach Lit Fest, this Saturday, March 23rd, at 10 a.m. out there in the Salton Sea, out in the desert. At 10 a.m. on the 23rd is the um, zine and culture panel that I'm on and will be... Uh, talking about the history of zines, and I'll be going into the history of chapbooks. I'm going to try to record as much of it as I can, and then, uh, what do you call it? Um, Anytime I'm ready now. Come on, motherfucker. 
Oh, I'm going to be reading some poems. Jesus fucking Christ. What's your job? Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be doing that. The next normal version of this podcast is going to be a conversation I had with Adam Crawford about poetry audiobooks um, in lieu of chapbooks. So make sure you stick around for that. I mean, you don't have to stick around. It's going to be like next week sometime probably. In the like first two weeks of the month of May, okay, I'm going to be on the East Coast. So this is me extending a fucking olive branch to you fucks, okay? If you want me to read somewhere, do a workshop, do a panel, do whatever the fuck, anytime in between, let's just say May 1st through May 15th, give or take, I don't give a shit. Somewhere in that general vicinity of the New England-ish area, I'll even go down the coast a little bit because I'm going to have to go a little bit down the coast. If you want me to do anything in your neck of the motherfucking woods, you have to let me know. I'm booking all that time up, okay? And as far as I know, I will be in, um, I guess, Malden, Massachusetts on May 13th. Jeff Taylor from the Garage Poets uh, poetry reading thing, open mic thing that he does out there. So, um, for those of you in that area, um, that's going on. And, um, that is the only thing set in stone. So let's get the fucking chisel out. Let's get the fucking hammer out. Let's start making some fucking tombstones, guys. We've got a lot of bodies to bury. Let's do this. We don't got a whole lot of time. All right. So this Saturday, Salt and Sea, Bombay Beach Lit Fest. Be there with bells on or else you're a fucking douchebag, okay? And with that said, go buy Matthew Buckley Smith's book Midlife. There will be a link down below. And now, Matthew Buckley Smith. Like, I honestly, like, I kind of like their the idea of there being a weird little indie poetry podcast scene that isn't all perfectly... Like where not everybody perfectly gets along, and there's some slightly there's some slight cross purposes. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that suggests that like there's something healthy happening. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not just a mutual masturbation circle. Yeah, like, these are people actually trying to talk about work and figure out what they're you know like take some things seriously. To me, that's a that's all that's all a good sign. Yeah, like Paul Paul Bloom's case is like empathy is not is like arguably not a great thing. <laughs> like like it's yeah. it's very clearly valuable. Clearly has great importance but also it is pretty good at causing a lot of problems like if i had to fire someone oh god from a job like that would be like i would put it off like a week and every day i would just be miserable trying to figure out how to fucking break it to this guy and um yeah i've been in kind of situations like that and i usually just pass the buck to somebody else you're That's like the guy in the uh the you know the old riddle about the guy who is supposed to be executed and he has a week to wait. Uh -uh. So there's a, there's a riddle about a guy who's he's told that he's going to be executed. And there's within one week in one week's time within, within the following week, he'll be executed. Okay. And he's told that it will be at a certain time of day and that it will be, it will come as a surprise to him. But it's the time. Well, no, he knows it'll be like 6 PM. Okay. But it'll be on one of one day oh, okay. in the in the week to come. Okay. And but he's told it'll be a surprise. And so what he very quickly concludes is, you know, it's Sunday through Saturday, the week. Yeah. And so he says, well, it's not gonna be Saturday night, right? Because if it were Saturday night, then it wouldn't be a surprise. Right? Okay. Like if the only night left is Saturday night, then I know when it's gonna be, and so it can't be Saturday night, which means it has to be one of the previous nights. Okay. And so then he says, Well, if I know it's not Saturday night. Then it can't be Friday night. Because <laughs> if I already know it's not Saturday night, then by the time it gets to Friday night, it would then Friday is the only available option left. And so it can't be Friday night either. And since I know it's not Saturday or Friday, it can't be Thursday. And he works his way up through the whole week until he concludes that he's not going to be executed at all. And then uh he gets through the whole week, and then on Saturday the executioner arrives. <laughs> it's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's what that's you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how that's how you would fire someone. <laughs> oh, what a fucking dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God this is like you. I realize like half of the jokes my dad told me growing up were just execution jokes. <laughs> I don't know why like, there are a lot of them. Wow. That's one um subgenre of jokes I didn't even know existed. Yeah, Catholics, man. Yeah. I was gonna ask you actually about that last podcast you did. Hmm. Um I got oh I got some got some email. <laughs> you got some what? I got some email about it. I actually uh am in the process of oh here we hold on a minute. I am about to yeah. So I got some email about it. So the thing, the secret show episode I've just now posted oh, okay. is um is in response to uh, at least in part in response to some of the email I got about it. So did you get anyone saying you were being too nice to Stalin? Oh no, I didn't oh, hear I just that. I got a thing for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that wasn't what I heard. Uh no, did you? It is. I mean, I could. I can imagine that, but I don't think I was too nice. To no, him. I don't think. I don't think you yeah. were being too nice to him. But I could just picture somebody. Yeah, yeah. Like if I were to do that episode, somebody would go, <laughs> "What are you being a fucking fascist now? You're fucking like kissing up to Stalin's corpse and shit like that." <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, "Oh Jesus!" But yeah. yeah, like as soon as you started, I was like, "Uh oh, this is a slippery slope." But then, like you like started like, and I'm like, "Oh okay, that's okay." He's yeah, I mean, killing it. yeah, I, I think uh, I think the the article itself was pretty was was pretty anti Stalin. No, it was just really weird because like I listened to that episode the night before last night, and that day I was doing a live stream, and somebody started saying because I was complaining about like the online book community and stuff like that. And just like mm. typical bullshit. And somebody started talking about how, well, you know, people who read books are generally just way more um, sensitive than people who don't read books. <laughs> and it started like, people were, like going back and forth. And I'm like, actually, it's funny you bring all this up. I don't know. Like my sister can't read a fucking menu, but like she'll cry yeah. watching something on Hallmark. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So right. I mean, like, which also was true for like tens of thousands of years of human history. Like, nobody could read anything. Like, I don't know. It just seems kind of yeah. Strange. But at the same time, a, a cougar could come take your baby, and you're like, oh no, we just need to have another yeah, baby now. Oh, I wanted to talk to you about this too, because um, this is kind of something that you've talked about recently. I think I was gonna post this thing, and then I didn't end up doing it because I don't want to hurt people's feelings or break their trust or whatever. Okay. But I feel like I'm getting to the point where I fucking just hate poetry because I can't <laughs> find anything that is really like speaking to me. Like I could yeah, tell yeah. if something is good or if something is yeah, yeah. palatable or whatever, but I haven't been wowed mm. by a poem in so fucking long that it's yeah. making me feel like, like what's wrong with me. But then at the same time, I'm like, am I just in a bad headspace? And I just need to like go back and read stuff that I already know I like and just kind of like help yeah. my way through it. I mean, I so much relate to that. I mean, you, you know, that was my wife's experience to the point at which she just stopped writing and reading poetry altogether. Like she got, a master's in English with a focus on Gates and then got an MFA in poetry and then quit poetry. <laughs> like she really, you know, like it was a big part of her life and yeah. she got so disgusted with it that she totally abandoned it. Like would never read it at all if she weren't married to me and then begrudgingly, you know, reads a few things now and then. But yeah, I, I very much re relate to that. I mean, I am, I'm a little bit, baffled by people who don't experience that and you know i think like i mean the, the most obvious example that comes to mind is shane mccray who's i mean i think partly because he did have a pretty nightmarish upbringing i think poetry has always been such a refuge for him yeah that it's sort of he's always happy to go back to it even when he doesn't like a lot of it like it never, but I, I just, I don't know. I can't imagine that there isn't a point at which you get a little disgusted, like a little, yeah. 
I mean, and then here's the question I, I have for you is like, I want to know if this thought crosses your mind. Okay. When you're reading, I don't know if this is, if, when when you're having this experience, this is mostly when you're like reading slush pile stuff or when you're reading stuff on websites or Twitter or where where are you reading stuff when you're having this <clears throat> feeling of being It's disgusted? usually because someone says, oh my God, I read this poet and thought of you. You totally need to read this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's worse. Um, it's a it's a personal recommendation. Yeah, so the personal recommendations right. yeah. suck. <clears throat> Slush pile stuff kind of sucks anyway. I mean, I haven't put anything out since I took my sabbatical, like right. other people's shit. And um, when I didn't put people's stuff out, like when I'm like, okay, I'm gonna put this on hold. The amount of bullshit fucking emails and messages I got from other fucking poets made me like not even want to fucking put anybody out ever again. I'm like, Oh wow. Like you're a piece of shit. Like I just fucking got <laughs> finished telling you that I'm having a really fucking hard time right now. But then even yeah. like reading books from poets that I do like that are newer books. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, Oh my God, what the fuck is this? Like, this is really fucking bad. And so yeah. then it becomes like, do we only like stuff because of where we were in our life when we read something? So it brings us more joy and brings us happier thoughts than if we're in a yeah. darker place and then we read shit and it's not as good. Yeah. But there's also like, there's plenty of stuff we've read at times when we, like I've read at times when I was really sad mm -hmm. and it, and it, I really connected with it and it became yeah. something that I held on to, you know, there's stuff I read in college or in grad school that when I was feeling really bad that I, that I take comfort from now in part because of that. But I, I mean, so, because of that time and what partly, it did yeah. with that time. So it's like a nostalgia. Part, partly it is. I don't think that's all of it. Cause there's also stuff that I have a nostalgic fondness for. And when I've gone back to it, I think like, oh, that's, there's not as much here as I thought it was. Which is a different kind of, you know, disappointing yeah. feeling. But it, like, in a way, reading something and thinking like, what the fuck is this is less depressing to me than reading something and thinking like, oh, this is nice, but what the fuck did you do with the rest of it? And like, why do you have all this garbage next to it? Yeah. Do you have the feeling of like, this is all just equally shitty nonsense or do you have the feeling of like oh there's some gold in here but it's just muddied up with a bunch of bad writing cross right is that yeah. the feeling you have um sometimes but it's usually like what the fuck is this right like, yeah if it, well, if it, just, it gets to, yeah. it gets to the point where it's like why am i continuing to do this it's like, how many times do I have to put my hand on the stove before I'm like, oh yeah, that burns. Well, so then here, this is where I, I do wonder about like one of our biggest philosophical disagreements, which is about restraint and revision. Okay. Because, because like your, your argument you've made in the past is don't revise, don't hold back, just publish things because you never know what, you know, thing you write that's going to really Makes is going to stick, you know, change somebody's life, right? You're like, yeah, and that's totally when you're going to put true, something out because these or, books are books that people said are great books. Here, read them, right? So they they <laughs> I found this like stained, them. crumbling champagne cork. It really reminded me of your dick. <laughs> you'll you'll never believe how close it is. It's you know, yeah. Um, um no, I, yeah. I get your point, but right. I mean, I still don't think because I think poetry is the only art form in the fucking universe. Where people are like, oh, I'm not going to put this out. I'm going to hang on to this for 10 years and then go come back to it. No, no, not at all. That was something actually um, uh, Richard Feynman used to do that. He used to like shatter the dreams of his colleagues who would like work for a year on some paper that they thought was like a really great idea they'd come up with. And then they would bring it to him and say like, Richard, could you look this over? See if you think this might be, I might be onto something. And he would glance at it and he'd, and then he'd reach into his file cabinet and he'd pull out a paper on exactly the same topic. And he'd say, yeah, I wrote that a few years ago. I didn't think it was worth publishing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like people in all sorts of fields 
do that. There's certainly plenty of people who, I mean, plenty of like visual artists who don't put work out once they've made it. There's certain, I mean, I think I don't, but is that more of their dealer? Like their people who are like, uh, like, let's not put this out yet. Like you have a big show coming up. Let's try to sell some of this stuff because the least amount of stuff you have, the more valuable it is in the art world. I mean, sure. That's part of it. But I also just think that like, that's not, that's only true in certain very limited cases. Like for the yeah. average artist, it's not like they're worried about flooding the market. They're trying to sell some work. Yeah. I, I just think that, that, I mean, I, maybe artists and other m media work really differently, but I just imagine that for a lot of artists, the ex there's an experience of getting into something, working on it, you know, having a kind of a, an interesting idea, trying some things out, trying to kind of find a shape to it, bring it to a, bring it to some sort of resolution, feel like you've kind of finished the working of a piece and then think like, well, and it's just, it just isn't that like, I just don't care about it that much. It's just not that great. I'm not going to bother to say, I mean, I do think like the submission process is something that is in a certain way peculiar to poetry. Like, I don't think exactly this, like there's not a perfect, there's, there's not a perfect correlative in other art forms exactly for the submission mm -hmm. process in poetry. But yeah, I just think like, for sure, lots of other artists have to go through something similar where they make a lot of work and they think much of it is just not worth the time. It's not worth other people's time to, to, to look at. Like, how could that not be the case? Right. I mean, I certainly know, like, you know, my, my dad is a visual artist and he does sell paintings and he does, you know, do commissions and he does donate things. Like he will do work for specific purposes, mm -hmm. but also if you go in a studio, there's like shit everywhere, you know, like there's like little doodles and there's studies and there's like some stuff that he kind of has been working on and maybe he'll finish it. Maybe he won't. There's but just is like there anything in there that like you go, Oh shit, this is really cool. And he's like, no. Well, uh, I mean, there's plenty of stuff that I think looks cool. There aren't, it's not like there are a lot of completely finished works that I would say like, wow, that's amazing. And he would say, no, I'm never going to send that out to anybody. I mean, I think like, Partly because like, you know, if I said like, that looks amazing, that would probably be some sort of affirmation. But I also think like, I'm not seeing like there's stacks of stuff. Like I'm not seeing yeah. everything. And that's certainly true for me. Like what, what does not happen to me all the time is that I, I write a thing and somebody I trust says, oh, that's amazing. And then I say, no, I'm not going to send it to anybody. Usually they just never see it okay. or they will see a version of it or like somebody <laughs> will say. Somebody will like a version of it, but say, oh, it needs some work and maybe I'll work on it. Maybe it'll get there. Maybe it won't. I mean, I've definitely published things in magazines that I then didn't include in collections. Yeah. Because I thought they just weren't quite there. Well, have you ever read something that somebody sent you to look at and then you thought it was good and then they said it wasn't done? Uh, Yeah, but I don't know. But I think there's also a big difference between not done and uh and like nobody's ever going to see this right okay. well yeah like, and it, yeah and, and it's usually it usually honestly it usually goes the other way around usually it's like is this done yes or uh, maybe maybe it needs this little line slightly different maybe it, you know um that just, I mean, i've, uh, cer I've certainly had maybe. people say like hey whenever that thing you read is done uh you know, if I like I've, at reading, sometimes I'll say like, "Oh, I'm working on this thing," and I've had people say, "Hey, whenever you finish that thing, send it to me. I'd like to publish it." Oh, so, so you'll do a reading of shit that's not ready? Well, <laughs> I try to do read things, the things that are ready for the reading. Mm -hmm. There's certainly things I have felt less ready about later. You know, well, why like do you why do you say this isn't ready when you read it? I, I I don't read it and say this isn't ready. I'll say this is something I've been working on. Um or like I'm not like okay. uh this is a working title or I don't know, you know, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Partly because I think like that can be a way to to test it a little bit. Mm -hmm. To see how it lands, you know? So, like my wife will send me drafts and she's learned that the best way to get herself to figure out how to fix certain things in a draft will be just to send it to me and then immediately regret sending it mm -hmm. and then say like instantly say like, Oh, don't read that. I fix something. So I think sometimes like a, 
a reading can be kind of a low stakes way to like try something out and see see how it lands see how it's you know because i've also had like a i had a piece that i showed ryan who's sort of my my kind of closest oldest reader um collaborator and he said oh this is terrible and i thought i think there's something there and i kind of kept messing with it and kept working on it and then i read it at a at a, like a reading of you know smallish room of like 30 people yeah and it and like i thought it went pretty well and i did a little more work on it and then i showed it to him again and he was like oh this is great so yeah i mean i think like readings can be kind of a nice way to i mean i always like i was a drama major like i like performance so i i kind of like using readings i like there to be a little bit of risk a little bit of uncertainty you know i don't want to read like what i never want to do is go to a reading and only read every like things that i already published a long time ago and nothing else yeah right to me that just feels very dull sometimes what i do is um live stream my writing huh what <laughs> you're like what like i'll have like a, a live stream on my youtube channel that has like my um screen on the thing and i'll just write live and people talk to me while i'm doing it what yeah i don't like they can see what you're typing, typing. as you're typing it yeah but you're also talking to them like when i finish something i'll like answer comments or questions or just shoot the shit with people and then what? not look at it again and then go back and start working on the next thing oh man that feels like you're trying to like negotiate with a contractor while impregnating your wife <laughs> just like i don't think i could do a good, either of those tasks like, no, but I'm just I'm just saying, like, is that a good way of testing something to see if it works? Uh, like, like you wouldn't do that, is what you're saying. I just I can't. I don't. I like to. I don't like to. I mean, I will like. I like to write sometimes in the company of other people. Like it's why I used yeah. to like. I, you know, I would write in bars or in cafes, you know, it's still writing a cafe up the street sometimes, but not if other people can see what I'm writing as I'm writing it. That's a nightmare. That's because then you'll, nightmare. they'll know that you're talking shit on them. Oh no. I mean, it's not even talking <laughs> shit on them. It's just like, I can't, I mean, to me, the people talk about like silencing the inner critic. And I think that's mm -hmm. a little bit of a simplistic way of framing it, but like to me, like if you want to make sure you're not silencing the inner critic, then like have other people read your work as you're writing it to me that's like a way to amplify the inner critic you think so i yeah i think i mean I, I also think like this may be the difference between people who can have a cigarette occasionally and people mm. who can't ever have cigarettes or, or will have a all the cigarettes like when i smoked i smoked all the cigarettes all the time all the cigarettes yeah yeah i can't not like i don't and like it almost made me mad when I would like have friends who would smoke like three or four cigarettes in a day. Like, yeah. what the fuck are you doing? Get out of here. That is a disgrace. Yeah. I had this uh, yeah. guy I worked with who only smokes cigarettes at night and I'm like, why? And he's like, because that's, Asshole. When, you're, that's when you're relaxing and you're dining and you're having some good. Wine. That man has no respect for cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> he should have it a smoking license. Crazy. For, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not, yeah. He should not be permitted to purchase cigarettes anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. he he actually blew his head off. Jesus Christ. So, <laughs> I don't know if the two were correlated, but, but uh, yeah, I won't, I won't make a joke about how he could have smoked more during the day. But yeah. Um, yeah. That's a different sad story than the story I thought we were. I thought we were having a different conversation. That's like the line in, um, do you know the, the, the Joe Wenderoth uh, poem where he's, He's standing in line at a Wendy's and this like nice old man and is standing in front of him and the line's taking forever. And the old man turns around and kind of chuckles and says, well, you'd think they're growing the potatoes back there. And then Joe Winderoth says, daddy fucked me. And then the guy's <laughs> face collapses and he sort of turns slowly away. And, and then Joe Winderoth's <laughs> line is he says, he says, we were both on the same ball field, but we were playing different games. <laughs> like, 
I thought I thought we were having a different conversation, and then the guy blew his head off, and it turned out okay. It was well, that. honestly, that rendition of that poem is the best poem I've heard in weeks. So, <laughs> Joe Winderout's pretty good. Yeah, you yeah. you might it's a it's a book called Letters to Wendy's. You might you might like. Uh, yeah, I, so I'm like I'm I'm the guy who I can't smoke any cigarettes if I'm not going to smoke all of them, and so I yeah. think you know. I am so self-conscious. I I couldn't have people watch what I'm writing as I'm writing it. It may be that if you are, if you have so conquered your self-consciousness that you can and it doesn't matter at all, then like then then great. Mm -hmm. I definitely don't have that. Like do, when you, when when she gives you stuff, do you give her like yeah. super like boilerplate? Like, oh, you know what you need to do is she hates she hates how I help like we read we we work very differently with each other like when, yeah. when she reads my stuff she gives me that kind of advice like mm -hmm. cut this add this this is good this is bad i like this i don't like that yeah and that's very useful i think like that's much more useful than than most criticism i give a very different set of like the thing that most people think psychologists or psychiatrists are in tv and movies where they like they're like have your a haunted child draw me a picture of the woods and then i'll interpret it and that will help us solve the crime like that's what people think psychiatrists are yeah uh joanna like psychiatrists are like much more like the plumbers of the brain um and I, I do like tv psychology stuff to her stories when when she gives them to me and like yeah. we've we have a rapport we have a way to work together and i think it i think it works pretty well at this point but but like part of the process is she hates the process and she screams at me and she's like, yeah, like presents me, you know, oh, like the whole oh, yeah. time. It's only later afterwards. She's like, Oh, that was, that was really helpful. I'm like, well, I wish it could have been a little less like in theory, <laughs> like up until this point, a, a little less shouty. And, <laughs> and by the way, chapter seven means you hate your mom. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, it's unfortunately, it's not even that stuff. It's sort of like, I'll, you know, I'll like talk, it's it's like yeah it's it's like what do you think about what do you think it is about this party scene that really feels essential to you what if mm -hmm. we removed the child what if we changed the setting what if and she's like this is terrible advice i hate every yeah. minute of it it's like when her dad taught her to drive um, well if you if you remove the child it becomes a kidnapping book that's true yeah. And sometimes that, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in like counterfactuals as a, an aid to criticism, like try yeah. out, like imagine what it would be like if you changed something. And often the answer yeah. is it would be worse, but if it is worse, then that tells you something about why it is the way it is. Yeah. Like make everyone at the party on fire. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and what I'm really looking for is not like, you know, the, the thing everybody gets wrong about Freud when they say he this is what you had me on for us to talk about what everyone gets wrong about Freud, right oh yeah that's uh, usually this, what everyone ends up talking about when they come on my yeah. show for some stupid fucking reason <laughs> people say like oh well freud freud said if you dream about water it means sex and like that like that's exactly wrong like yeah. he, he specifically makes the point that there is no universal code book to dreams and the psyche the question is what does it mean to you yeah. And so, so really a lot of what I do with her stories is I'll tug on different threads to see what gets a rise out of her. Yeah. Because often I think, you know, like she's a very intuitive writer and so she'll put a bunch of stuff out there and it's like rich and interesting and full of possibility. And if it were my story, I might write it in one particular way. And if it were, totally. your, were your story, you would have somebody stitch eyeballs into his scrotum, but it's yeah. her story. And so I'll say like, well, let's tug on these elements. It's sort of like tapping blocks while you're playing Jenga. Yeah. Like, which one is going to move? Mm -hmm. And so you can find the one that's like, oh, that's what you need to be writing about because that's what you care about. So as an editor, do you think um, <clears throat> you have a better like relationship slash rapport with editing your wife's stuff than you would just poems that come in? Well, for one thing, she doesn't write poems. Well, I know, but I'm just saying, yeah. like, do you think you can use that same logic you do with her with the people who send in poetry submissions? 
Mm, no, but not because I don't, I can't edit poems. I do edit poems. Um, I mean, Ryan, I'll do that with Ryan. Like Ryan and Brian, Ryan writes poems, Brian writes fiction, and Joanna are all people I'm close enough to as a writer that I will actually offer like rewrites or re like I will, I will actually get into the, I'll like put my hands in the cookie dough with them. Yeah. But that's ve like with very few people will I do that. I'll, I'll get pretty intimate with like Jonathan's criticism and his poetry, but not quite in that way. But I also think like with submissions to the magazine, I, uh, it was actually, it was a guy I worked under at verse magazine by the name Brian Henry. Okay. Who does not like me. <laughs> very like, very like post avant poet. Uh, didn't like me at the time that I was a student. Definitely doesn't like me now, but you know, he's a smart guy. I learned a lot from him. Um, he said, it's not worth trying to get poets to revise their work. Just accept it or don't. Yeah. And I think he's probably right about that. I, I, I think it, I agree with that to an extent. It, it just, I think like there are, you know, and, and there are cases where like at literary matters, we will offer, offer a cut or a revision or a this or a that. I can just tell you that is almost never, if ever coming from me, it's almost always coming from one of the other editors. Yeah. I, I tend to think like, take it or don't. Um, do, do you, think, you don't you don't have that kind of relationship with somebody who's just submitting to your magazine, right? Yeah, like that's not. Yeah, yeah, it's just like it's a little too in, in intimate, you know. How important do you think it is for an editor to have an intimate or close relationship with the writer? It depends on what kind of editor we're talking about. So if you're editing a magazine, it doesn't need to be that intimate. Yeah. Right. Like if it's, if you're, if you're accepting or rejecting poems, it doesn't need to be that intimate. Uh, yeah. it needs, honestly, it needs to be a little bit more intimate if you're, if you're doing criticism, because that's a, that's a kind of, that's actually a little more of a conversation. Like yeah. I've had some really good conversations with editors who were publishing criticism that, that I wrote where they would really get into the weeds with me. And like, that could be that could be valuable. My principle for whether or not somebody gets to make real critical suggestions is, is that person on board? Like, is that person on the hook for the project? Like yeah. if that person is like someone who is close to you in your life, like who's going to be there in your life after this thing gets published, or that's somebody who is like invested in the work of art as a collaborator, as an agent, as like a, editor of a book that for a publisher like is this somebody who's sort of whose name is going on it in the same way yeah. or who is like an intimate of yours and therefore really invested in you if that is somebody if, if it's somebody outside that circle i tend to think i have no interest in hearing critical suggestions from you know unless i request them yeah i just think like it's not that somebody outside that circle can't give a good suggestion it's just that for my purposes, I think it is that I'm healthier and I'm better able to keep functioning in the world if I just ignore people outside that mm -hmm. set. Because otherwise, like the thing is, like I'm like I'll go crazy because I'll just listen to everything. Like I'll become yeah. so hyper self conscious and I'll just like I, I will allow all criticism to resonate absolutely with me and that's and then it just it's it's like uh, it's crippling that's crazy like <clears throat> i think um i i don't know like i feel like i have crippling self-doubt and all that other shit like everybody else but i also feel like my work is very sociopathic in the sense that like I think my shit is amazing and mm -hmm. I think my like I feel like I'm the the best poet there is but yeah, 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 yeah. like and whenever like I write a story or I'm working on a bigger project like as soon as I'm like in the point where people are giving me feedback I'm like well I'm already done with that now I'm moving on to something else kind of thing and um yeah. i just i 
I, I've never, I've never been able to linger on something for a long time. And that might just be like a, a mental thing for me. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, I wonder how much of that has to do with how you left the environment you grew up in. Whoa. Like, <laughs> right. I mean, I, a little bit. Yeah. I, I think that, like, that's some deep shit. Okay. Come on. Let's do this. Like, what is it? Well, I don't know. Like, I mean, because you, you, you were raised Pentecostal or evangelical. Um, I wasn't raised anything. And then I brought religion into my family when I was like a teenager. <laughs> And then quickly. Oh, left. okay. Well, that's a little bit different then. Yeah. All yeah. right. So you, you, you like experimented with the, with Christianity, like you were experimenting with drugs, which you probably also did. Yeah. Um, okay. That's a little different. Do you, what is the, like, how big a distance do you think there is philosophically or uh, psychologically between where you are now and where you were like, in your family growing up? Oh, I don't know. Um, like, have you, let me put it this way. Yeah. Have you had to radically reassess your worldview? A few times, I think. Okay. Yeah. What, what, what brought, brought it about? Um, Trump being a fucking piece of shit. Well, what, so what did that change then for you? Um, it, cause like I used to be very much, um, socially liberal, uh, fiscally conservative. And, right. um, then like you thought there should be lower income taxes. Yeah. And I thought trickle down economics was a, like a real thing that worked. Right. Okay. You know, but like I yeah. didn't want anyone to tell my gay friends they couldn't get married. And stuff like sure, that. sure, sure, yeah. Um, and then when I like when lockdown happened, and I was kind of really far away from politics for the most part, yeah. Um, but then when lockdown happened, like I obviously probably had a little bit more time on my hands, and I didn't understand why things were being handled the way they were being handled, and mm -hmm. I started researching more and more stuff and started seeing a, a lot of flaws in how I had always thought things should go, whether it be the economy whether it be um, just the social structure of um, like, again, because I grew up in a place where that was very diverse. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, was around all different races all the time and didn't think anything of it. And so if someone asked me in 2016, if there were Nazis around, I would go, of course not. Are you nuts? Right, like, right, right. Like, yeah, what are you yeah. talking about? But then like, I would go on tour and go through uh, middle America and go, Oh shit. Like these are just a bunch of white folks here that they probably never seen yeah, anyone yeah, who yeah. wasn't white, you know? Oh, wait, uh, sorry. Speaking of which, you, have you seen green room? No. Oh my god! Oh, you have to see it. What? What's it on? Oh shit! I don't know. I don't. It's on some street, but like it's it's so good. It's about okay. a punk band touring uh, rural Oregon, and they oh been there, yeah. And they stop at this like weird, weird. They think it's sort of like a weird environmentalist compound, but it turns out to be a white supremacist compound. Oh shit! And things get like real gnarly. It's oh my god! So it's such a just like heart pounding awesome movie yeah oh shit okay yeah you would yeah green room all right i'll, I'll look into that yeah it's sorry but you were saying you, you no, no but i'm just saying like there were a lot of things that i took as absolutes that just weren't because i did not see what other people saw you yeah. know and when i realized that like a lot of my shit changed a lot of my worldview has changed. All right. So it, maybe it was, yeah, your views were changed through direct encounter with reality, but not necessarily through like uh, dialogue. 
like it wasn't listening to people say things that changed your mind. It was seeing a different side of the country. It was seeing a different side of the country and then researching things because I still needed to know why the things I thought were right weren't right. Like I could feel that they're not right, but I need like actual tangible evidence that they're not right. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah. All right. That makes some sense. Yeah. That seems like a good, actually probably pretty healthy way to go about your life and figure out what you believe. I have almost I'll always, take word like, for it. yeah, I think for me, it's like, I've always lived in words and bit like I went from believing one set of things, mostly because all the people around me insisted that things were that way. Exactly. To believing an almost opposite set of things, but also only because the people I was surrounded by started saying things were this other way. And it left me deeply uncertain about what to believe in general. And increasingly just cynical about what everybody says and believes yeah uh, but also it's also like left me very vulnerable to the possibility that i could have things wrong and so uh, when i hear external criticism i can't i can't just write it off i can't just let it roll off my back right like i have to say there's a chance this is right yeah because it's been right in the past right like i've uh, i've had my mind changed a number of times about things but almost always just by way of words. So I, I have to be careful basically about what I even bother to let in. Cause like what I'm, what I, what I'm not capable of doing is not digesting it. Like I was talking to Joanne about this, like I think for a lot of people, uh, they just, they're just able to like binge and purge certain kinds of, uh, conversation, certain kinds of, um, arguments like they just sort of take them in and then they vomit them up and then they move on yeah for me it's like i'm incapable of vomiting so i have to like i have to metabolize all of the alcohol like i have to let it go through my liver every time yeah and at a certain point it'll, it's just gonna fucking kill me so i have to be a little bit careful about what i bother to metabolize huh so you know ahead of time that like I can't hear anything from here or here because I'm gonna have to digest that. So then no, you just shut that off. No, I, I li the problem is I actually listen to and read uh, too much of everything. Uh -huh. Um, but I, um, it, when I'm picky is when I know that it's about my own work because okay. I care more about my work than I do about my dignity or like politics or sanity right okay. so what i what i will do is if i know something is going to just make me feel angry and shitty and that i already think there are problems with it i will still probably read it or listen to it and then just feel sickened by it because i can't just throw it up i can't just move on i can't just shrug it off which is why like i could never do the open screen composition exercise yeah so like if you send a poem you wrote to a couple different people and one person says it's great and the other person says uh this third stands is pretty fucking weak like does that mean you disregard the person who says it's great and focus on the third stanza being weak uh yeah i don't do that <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that. Whatever you said, that's not a thing. Uh, yeah. Well, I just don't send, I don't know. Like I don't send poems to, I mean. Oh, you don't send it to multiple people at a time. Yeah. I don't send poems out a lot to, I mean, I mostly just sit on them for a long time and okay. then I don't send most of them to anybody. And I pick well, a very like small you, number. You said send. that you like do that thing with those women, right? Like, like your chick. Oh yeah. But we thing. don't really do. We don't really do feedback with those. Like, oh, okay. we don't. We do like, we will maybe say a, a sentence or two, but mostly yeah. it's just like, all right, I wrote this. See y'all next week. Um, okay. that's not, and, and that's like those I have published some, like, uh, some of those have, have, you know, come out, um, not in the book yet, but, uh, but like some of those have been in other places, but that's like one 
maybe one in 10. And that is how you cut up a podcast and make it sort of make sense, okay? I just noticed that I have this really cute little bump it in my hair. I feel like a pretty girl from 2005. What we were talking about was, oh yeah, go buy midlife. What the fuck's wrong with you? You haven't done it yet. You're kind of fucked up. Like you've been getting all of this like free fucking entertainment and knowledge bombs and shit. You're not even buying Matthew Buckley Smith's fucking book yet. The Amazon link is right there. Like it's really not that fucking hard. And then Shaylin told me she has six copies of her book left. Why haven't you guys gone to shaylinmarks.com and get her book? In fact, I have a bunch of, oh, you can't just get it on a website. So you have to fucking actually go through the fucking hard ass shit and fucking email me and say you want some books. Oh my fucking God. Your life is so fucking terrible. First world fucking problems. <laughs> you mean to tell me there's not a hyperlink to buy your books yet? Oh man, this fucking guy. I know. I'm a fucking piece of shit. How fucking dare I? Oh, my fucking God. All right. Anyway, um, I forgot to mention it in the beginning of the show. Um, If you go over to a YouTube channel called Adam Gary Poetry, uh, he was nice enough to have me on his series he's doing on his channel. Um, I think it's called Conversations with Poets. I don't know. I might have dreamt that. Maybe it's something, like, kind of horrific sounding and, like, like, uh... Like, death from above, or like, chicken guts, or something. I don't, I don't, I think it's called Conversations with Poets. Uh, Maybe Conversing with Poets, because it says verse, and so that's kind of like, ooh, like a play on poetry. I don't fucking know, I don't remember. It was a good time, we had a really good time. Um, Hopefully I will get him on this show soon, and pick his fucking brain. Um, But we had a good time, so go over there and check that out. I haven't printed them out yet, but my new chat book is called What the Fuck is Happening? And that will be out maybe tonight. I might finish it up tonight um, and do that. So that is a maybe thing that's happening here soon. Um, The other thing I was going to say about that is I realized, I realized that come... Next month, maybe May, but more likely April, is going to be the last chat book that I make that's going to look like something like this, like the handmade chat books, the, the way it's been going, because I'm going to be moving and I'm not going to have my printer and I'm not going to like... Unless something drastically happens and I find, like, the best print shop in the world, um, I'm not going to be able to afford to do what I'm doing. With that said, um, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you guys let me know down below. Like, if I do it through a print shop, are you guys willing to spend, like, 20 bucks on a chapbook or 25 bucks on a chapbook? Um that seems a bit steep. It seems like, I mean, they would be collector's item kind of shit and limited run. So, um, you guys let me know. Cause if not, I'm either going to do just strictly digital eBooks or print on demand books. I, I, I haven't decided how I'm going to do this yet, but, um, so basically once this next book, maybe one more book, if I could squeak one out before I like get rid of everything, um, that's going to be the end of phase one of Poetic Anarchy Press and things are going to be different from there on out. So, um, I don't know, get the books while you can. There's, uh, not a lot of them. There are some, uh, titles that I have way more of than others, but, um, once those are gone, that's it. That's the end of it. And I have no idea what the fuck I'm going to do next. So there's that. So remember Bombay Beach Lit Fest this weekend, um, Saturday, March 23rd. The panel uh, about zines and culture starts at 10 a.m. And I will be on that panel and I will be reading some pims. And then um, I'm going to be in Malden, Massachusetts on May 13th. 
And in that area, the whole first half of May, so if you want me to come do a workshop, a reading, a signing, a, I don't know, you want to throw a fucking pie in my face, you want to dunk me in a fucking dunk tank, whatever the fuck you want, I don't really give a shit, I'm going to be out there anyway, so um, let's make the fucking most of it, okay? So hit me up at IHateMattWaltGmail.com, and now let me get to those sweet, sweet motherfucking bunt plungs. So I want to give a big thank you to all you motherfuckers over there on Patreon. Michael, Cedar, Harry, and Michael, you guys are the shit. Thank you so much. Over there in the YouTube, thank you, crew. I want to give a big thank you to Britt, to, uh, to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia, to Lauren. And actually, I still haven't, I need to update all this shit, and I haven't fucking done it yet. I apologize, guys. I am not prepared for this shit. Where do I go here? Where do I go? Where is the button? Here we go. Here's the button. And also, thank you to Nathan and to Joseph. Okay, so let's get over there to the motherfuckers in the Anarchy Crew with the Berg Swinger Ducks. I want to give a big thank you to Nate, to Mindy, to Shaylin, to Tamara, to Adam, to JH, to Cedar, to Lauren, to Chasey, to Michael, and then for the Bergest of the Swinging Dicks in the fracking world. I want to go a big thank you to Caitlin. You're the shit. Thank you so much. And let me see how many pages this chapbook is right now. 24. Mm, I'm going to add more poems. I'm going to add some more motherfucking poems. Watch me. Watch me do it. All right. So, with all of that said, I hope you've been enjoying all the awesome videos and vlogs I've been putting up on my YouTube channel. And, oh, and I want to say, we had the first Anarchy Crew um, writing Zoom of the year. And we're going to be doing this monthly. And it was fucking awesome. Uh, Adam showed up. Uh, Mindy showed up. And Lauren showed up. And Nicole showed up. And we had a great time. Uh, got a lot of writing done. We wrote five poems each. Um, had some great prompts. Let me see if I can remember the prompts. They were... We did a free write at the beginning, and then we did um, coffee, storms, hair, and anniversary were like kind of the prompt theme topic things, and we like went from there. It was it was a lot of fun, and if you are um, an Anarchy Crew or higher member, you can watch the replay of that. Um, it's really really cool. It was a lot of fun. So um, love that. And if you want to do the mentorship. Um, you could do that uh, through YouTube and then you get all of the videos in the Poetic Anarchy course and all the extra shit. There's a lot of songs I put up on there. There's the bonus shit like this episode with Bucks about me going to therapy. Um, that's going to be up on there. And then if you want some like real fucking hands-on shit and me critiquing your work and your work ethic and what to do next, you could join the top tier... I don't know. I forgot what the fuck I called it. I came up with a cool name for it the other night when I was in the shower, and then I I lost it. Forgot it. So it'll happen again, I guess. And you know, whatever. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, if if it if it doesn't, then the that crew level is gonna be stuck with some shit name that nobody likes. But you know, whatever. So keep buying my books, everybody. Type hard, and I will talk to you all later. Just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.